Welcome into episode 257 of the Skate Podcast. I am Brian D. Felice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, this is going to be our mailbag episode for the week heading into the holiday season. Scott, you had some very minor technical difficulties logging in today, but in true McLaughlin fashion, you just kind of powered through and it's all about the next shift. And um, until you popped in, Bridget and I were just quoting the Grinch and having a jolly old time. So uh, how, how are you guys doing? So was Xerxes. Xerxes was filling in as well. That's right. Xerxes was too, yeah. Yeah, I was like I was like Chevy Chase trying to figure out my Christmas lights and Christmas <laughs> vacation over here, just unplugging stuff, trying different fuses, and uh, got it figured out. Bridget, yeah. you, you actually never did a, a Grinch impression. Do you have one? I, I was doing um, mine before. No, I, I told you. Mine was uh, was – Dinner with me? I can't cancel that again. Seven thirty, wallowing self pity. Yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. Brian, see, Brian does the accent. <laughs> um. Anyway, let's get into the mailbag of, of this week because there's there's quite a few questions to go down. Uh, a lot of people emailing, tweeting, commenting on YouTube, uh, sending Scott handwritten letters, which I applaud as well. Um. So that was great. Why don't we start at the top here, and uh, and of course. I say let's start at the top, and I'm at the way bottom. There you go, Brian. Dash one. All right. Well, here's Chip. Chip. Chip says to us, um, maybe maybe Juice Box Kids is more appropriate for today's Bruins, Brian. And Chip, I found that I found it pretty funny. I, I I chuckled at that, Chip. And he was referring to how we were talking about the the lunch pill AC Bruins era night, and and how maybe today's di- hockey game is a little bit. I don't know. Less physical. I don't know. So that, that's that's what Chip was referring to there. I, I appreciate that comedy, Chip. Scott, what about you? Yeah, it, t- it took me a second to get that because originally I was like, "What what is he referencing? Like, did, did we bring up Juice Box Kids or something?" And then then it clicked. But yes, uh, I, I do think that's it's probably more appropriate just in general. I think for hockey today. Yeah, yeah. I want to say it's Bruins specific, but anyway, okay. But Chip did have some questions. Uh, starting with the first one, he says, do you think the Patra assignment tells you how the Bruins feel he fits with them this season? We'll start with that one. So maybe a little bit, but I don't think, because I, I guess like the way to take that is like, if you do think it says something about how he fits, maybe they're not super high on him. They think they're okay without him type thing. And I, I just wouldn't go that far. Um, I, I think at the very least it shows that they they don't believe that he is so essential that they need him for these next 10 games to collect as many points as possible. I, I think it pretty clearly tells us that they feel like they're they can get through without him, and that's in large part because – Morgan Geeky has played well at center and Pavel Zaka is now back. If Zaka was still injured, Patra's not going. If Geeky struggled at center and it was clear that he was way better on the wing, I don't think Patra would be going. So I think it's sort of the combination of all those things um, that, you know, they're still left with 12 forwards that they like. And I think they believe that, you know, even if something were to happen where they get a little shorthanded during these 10 games, they think this is overall going to be a good experience for Padre and he'll come back better, which will help them more in the long run so they can afford to take, you know, whatever hit this might be in the short term. I I do. Yeah. I mean, for, in terms of like what we can glean from what they think about him, it's definitely not like maybe we might've thought in the beginning, which was, you know, if he was a second line center, if he had carved that role out for himself by this point in the season, he wouldn't be someone that you would loan out. Like he would be essential. And I think that really that's just the word. Um, and the difference is that they, that he's not essential to them in their minds um, because they have geeky and um, he's been playing well enough. And like Scott mentioned, Zaka's back. There's, they consider themselves to have enough center depth to make up for him being gone. Um, and like we talked about last podcast, I do think it kind of, I don't like the optics of it. 
Um, I feel like there could be some psychological, you know, something going on um, for a guy who has to leave the team and um, just like knows that they're, they're like, yeah, you can go. We don't need you. Um, I don't know. I, Brian and I have both been on that side of the, should you, or should you not send Potter to world juniors? Cause we didn't agree with it. And one of the reasons is because it kind of, it, it looks like that to me. It looks, it looks, the optics aren't good. It, it doesn't, I think the question was getting to that. Like it, it mm. makes it look like they don't find him essential. Mm. And, and Scott, don't, don't say I never did anything for you because Scott, for the record, also um, co-signed on, if it were up to him, he wouldn't have sent Patra to world juniors, but he just wasn't as upset about it as you or I were Bridget. But um, ultimately, I, yeah, I agree with you guys. I think like if Patra was in a situation where he was a bona fide top two center production wise right now, and it's like, how do you just how do you, how do you send that guy to World Juniors? Um, but because because he's kind of he's kind of um, slowed down a little bit in the production category, but that also coincides with some of these scratches and the limited ice time. And what is it the chicken or the egg? Right? Is it he, he, his production is slowing down because he's getting healthy scratches, uh, scheduled healthy scratches, and not getting a ton of ice time, or is that? in part because of the lack of scoring. I don't believe that's the case. But in any event, to answer the question, I do believe that, yeah, I think the Bruins sending him, assigning him to World Juniors at least tells you that, like, they don't see him as 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 an integral part of their forward group, at least right now. I don't know how you could. Not to say they don't see him as part of their forward group, but an important part at this stage. If they thought that, I think he'd, be, he'd st still be um, in Boston right now. Uh, I don't know if you guys had to follow up on that. I Chip's second question. It took me a second to like read what he was saying. I love this question because it's so random. <laughs> it is so random, and I don't have the answer. I don't know if one of you two do, but it's actually a great question. So I'll, I guess I'll, I won't bury the lead. I, I'll read it quickly, Scott. I, I I think I might I might have a an answer at least. Okay, okay. I mean, I think I can come up with a a, a window. But I don't know specifically one. I but I'll get to the question. So his second question is, when did the tradition of the goal scorer leading the on ice players the length of the bench hitting gloves um, after scoring? I think that's what he's asking, right, Scott? So somebody scores, yeah, and they they go down the line of the bench and pound hands with everybody. When did that start? I feel like probably sometime in like the late nineties. I don't know. What do, what do you guys think? So you're pretty close, Brian. That's a good guess. So I had I not had like an extra 20 minutes before our pod started, I probably wouldn't have been able to look this up. But I did find like a couple articles and a little bit of research on it. And it seems like it kind of started Canadian juniors in the 90s at some point, started to catch on. And then where it came to the NHL was – the New Jersey Devils during their 1995 Stanley Cup run started doing it for every goal. So it became sort of their thing during that postseason run. Uh, and then it didn't like immediately spread like wildfire, but I think that was the clear impetus of like more teams starting to starting to do it. So um, yeah, I guess it seems like from what I was able to find, if you, as much as you can, possibly like pinpoint this it started with the 95 devils and then kind of spread from there in terms of the nhl do you think the goalie hugs will catch on the same way like in in 15 I, years I actually, now is actually everybody doing yeah i do too or, or some, something like or like at least like a goalie celebration after wins like yeah it might not all be hugs but you know goalies doing something yeah i, I, I definitely i definitely think that all mark and swayman have uh influence goalies goalie tandems around around the world of all ages so i mean who knows yeah i mean like they've talked about that they've said like people send them videos of like their kids doing it and stuff so mm. we do it we do we do a, a hug like that on the podcast when we record yeah you guys don't see that part it's when we hit we stop recording and then we do it it's like every every year and a half we do it in person <laughs> but i see scott all the time lucky him so <laughs> that's true that's true and I do have half his Christmas gift in. So 
I know what it is. And he's afraid to see. I can see it on his face. He's so nervous. No, we'll wait yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say afraid. I'd say I'm nervous. Scott, don't, there's there's literally nothing to be nervous about. Um, That's what they always say. Except I mean, for that I know how to use Photoshop. Ex except for the <laughs> fact that you may have to move <laughs> state or country. It's not, it's not that bad. Don't worry about it. Um, oh, but anyway. All right. Moving on down. Um, Kim has a couple of questions relating to Matt Potter heading to World Juniors. We briefly touched on him earlier. Um, her first question is, do you think this would have happened, meaning sending Patra to World Juniors, had the GM and Patra not be Canadian? As an American, I don't think I got how important this seems to be to Canadians until I started paying attention to the World Junior coverage once Patra was loaned. This tournament is a big freaking deal to Canadians. Yes, Kim, it is. Um, but I don't know if that is in the equation here, but I'll let... Uh, the two smarter people on the podcast respond to that. Yeah, I almost Scott and Xerxes, Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that'd be Bridget and Xerxes. Then. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I almost feel like, you know, once I saw this question, I was like, oh, duh. Like, we sh should have really clearly explained that because I, I know, like, you know, me and Bridget have done like a lot of college hockey stuff and World Juniors is big in those circles. And Brian, I know you've followed it for a long time too. And it's like, yeah, sometimes I forget that like there's people who are just NHL fans and might not pay a ton of attention to it, especially because the Bruins haven't had a ton of prospects in it over the years, or at least not like star prospects, um, you know, tournament MVP type of players. Uh, but yeah, it is in Canada, especially enormous. Like it's like a national thing for like two weeks um it always starts on boxing day which in canada is a holiday the day after christmas the 26th and it's like gets absurd ratings across the country of canada so yeah it is a huge deal and you know patra talked about that a little bit um about how he would always you know every boxing day that that's what you'd watch um i think if it were an american player he might have still gone because the U.S. the U.S. is actually favored to win gold over Canada this year. Um, the U.S. has a loaded team, so that yeah, would be another. Yeah, that team is ridiculous. Yeah, so like that would also be an incredible experience. Um, I do wonder if it was. I don't want to call it like a lesser country, but you know, if it was someone who was more of a long shot, I could see it maybe not happening. Where they might say like what's the point of really sending it someone over there to go, you know, whatever, like one and three in group play and get knocked out in the quarterfinals. Like, is that really valuable? Um, you know, they did send David Pasternak, who obviously is Czech, who's usually not one of the, one of the absolute favorites every now and then they medal. Um, but Pasternak had only played, I think five NHL games before, World Juniors that year, he had spent most of that season in Providence to that point. So I think the, the fact that he's Canadian matters, it certainly makes it a, a bigger deal. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it is a huge deal among like the college hockey ranks because, I mean, BC and BU are losing like half their teams. Like in college hockey, well, like- BC especially, yeah. BC is losing- seven players just on the U S alone, six or seven. Yep. Yep. It's, I mean, it's a big deal because they don't miss a lot of games, but the second half of the season for college starts pretty much right after Christmas. So like some guys will miss a game on like new year's Eve or whatever. And those teams, if you're watching college hockey are not going to look at all the same. I don't even know how BC is going to field a complete roster. Compl like, yeah, I think, I think they only have one game that these guys are going to miss, which like they clearly knew and planned for. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think BU has one game during that time too. And then you just hope that they're back um, by whatever, like that weekend is like January 9th, 10th or so, I think is when the college hockey season like really kicks back up. They're taking people off the street that week. So Scott, if you want to go play, I know you wouldn't play for BC, but 
That's right. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. There's a lot on, on this Potter world juniors, uh, storyline. So I'm going to skip on down to, um, to our next listener, Sam. And Sam says, enjoyed hearing all your thoughts on Lysel and Potter going to world juniors have to say, I agree with Bridget and Brian about uh, Patra joining Team Canada. That's it. That's you know, that's uh, it. And that's and that's my favorite that's comment of this entire email. You know, like the There's entire mailbag. No follow up question to that. I can't argue. I cannot argue with that point, Sam. I do I think agree. We should, with myself, I think well. we should end Sam it right is, here. Sam is banned. Sam is banned from submitting questions. Anyway. <laughs> well, Sam, Sam, you submit as many questions as you want, and I think that's a perfect question to end the, the episode on so thank you all for listening and we'll talk. <laughs> no i'm kidding all right um uh, i think the negatives absolutely outweigh the positives but i would love to be wrong here here's my question all right load management seems to be the main concern lately for the boston bruins with patra so the team put a plan in place and it seemed to be working he had fresh legs for the rangers game and got an assist right before he left why then is sweeney okay with Patra playing in World Juniors, where it's a bunch of games in a short amount of time. They clearly don't want him to hit a wall as the second part of the season starts. So why? Is it because it's juniors, uh, junior hockey, which obviously is easier than the NHL, and you don't have players like Ryan Reeves slamming you into the boards from behind, trying to end your career? Um, that last part was added color. Sam didn't write that part, but hey, it's entertainment. So, um, yeah, basically, what do, you, what do you guys have to say about the load management and World Juniors is a lot in a little time? It is. It, it could be as many as seven games in 11 days if Canada went all the ways to the gold medal game. I think it's also worth noting, though, that he's not playing any games this week. It's just tra- – or I guess they do have a couple exhibition games. But, you know, presumably there will be minutes kind of spread around in those – um, but it's a lot of practice time. It's a lot of camp over in Sweden, uh, which is also valuable because, you know, first and foremost, he's learning his new teammates, his new team, how they want to play, all that. But that's also in a Team Canada practice at World Juniors, you are testing yourself against the best in your age group, which is also what, which actually is not what you're going to be doing every game. It's what you'll do against other top teams. But Canada against like Switzerland or whatever, you're you're not really facing the best in the world in your age group. Um, so you take yes, that back a- about the Swiss. That's uh, unless, you don't need a rider. Think, I was going to say unless Nino need a rider still has eligibility. I don't. <laughs> and Nico uh, Heischer who, too. Who else? Roman Yossi, he's Swedish, right? I think. Um, uh-huh. Nico and, Heischer, and, sweet, uh, uh, Swiss. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it is a lot of games, but you're getting practice time on the front side of it. And then I think this kind of ties into a little bit of one of Kim's questions as well, but he's probably going to get a few days off when they come back. The Bruins are going to be heading to the West coast, like right when he gets back. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if he sits one or two of those games and kind of just maybe joins them for like practice and morning skate. But, you know, I, I would just caution people about that as well. Like if he comes back and doesn't play the first two games, it doesn't mean like, Oh my God, Patra's a healthy scratch from now on. It just means like, they're probably going to ease him in a little bit coming back from and world. Just, and just so people like, because not everybody in their life has traveled from Europe to the West Coast. That is a like a huge time change <laughs> to yeah. go from, you know, that's like you're awake at completely different times. It takes a long time for your body to adjust. I think it's so it supposedly takes you a day per hour the time there was an in time change. So, and I think that that would be, which about I don't like an, believe, by the way, I don't, I don't think that's, well, this was, a, I don't really was, care what the sign, science hey, says. He was, he was just going to say, I don't care what your doctor says, Bridget, that's incorrect. Um, <laughs> it take it does take that long, Scott, uh, 
for your for your like brain to actually get back on i mean this was my neurologist that told me i'm gonna listen to her um but so i, I think it's I know nine more. hour time difference is it not from sweden yeah, to yeah, california nine, yeah, that's that's hours. your body doesn't just go like figure that out immediately so um yeah that that i mean resting him might be the only option he might be all sort all out of sorts i know i would be by the way a little fun fact and forgive me if one of you guys have mentioned this already today or in a previous episode but uh patra seems to be on a line with is it morgan geeky's brother yeah is, Connor is geeky. fun fact yeah, I, I, we we actually talked to Morgan Geeky um, today, Thursday after practice, and uh, he more at that time Morgan Geeky wasn't aware that they were skating on the same line, so that was pretty cool. He said he he hadn't really like given Patra any advice on playing with his brother or his brother with with Patra. He said his his brother's more skilled with with the puck, um, you know, which. He, he's a first round pick. So that's, that's not too surprising. Um, I, I also, his, if people haven't seen him, just Google Connor geeky. Uh, he has like classic hockey flow. So I, I asked Morgan if, uh, if he ever had hair like that and he said he did, but then he started losing his. So that was the end of that. Oh, he, yeah. He that'll, do it. that'll do it. It's tough to grow. Well, the hair, but It won't grow. And, and the, the the fact that he's playing on a line with Connor Geeky kind of makes the next part of Sam's question interesting. I'll read this one because this is actually the the area that I was most concerned about as well. So um, Sam says, Don Sweeney said that Potter will rejoin the team once World Junior Championship is over and none of us have a magic ball. But one of the main concerns is that Potter will lose his starting spot while he's gone. It's one of the main reasons that Sam said they didn't want him to go to world juniors if geeky takes over the number three center slot or possibly merkel off if they decide to bring him up and try to generate some offense um because jake debrusque isn't gonna get done where does that leave patra if that happens do they try and put him at wing hoping that won't be the case because i see patra being a top center in the bruins long-term future and he needs to continue to develop in that position at the nhl level and so we already saw Morgan Geeky just take control of that spot. Like he, that line was a very effective line last game, the third line, which was JVR Geeky Frederick. Um, and Geeky had even done a, a, a pretty decent job playing first line setter. So I think there is concern with where does Patra fit when he comes back? If all of a sudden it's, you know, if, management and coaching is set to kind of keep things the way that they have been if they're clicking you know do you move geeky away from that spot it's that's the part that concerns me as well and in patra i don't think they'll play him at wing so then that's where it becomes like okay now we really see we'll really be able to see what they think of him and how um essential or not essential they they see him the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, Jim Montgomery never changes his line. So if they're set, then he's just screwed. So well, you say that, but Scott, what did I lean over and say to you last game? Yeah, so for this is one the game, first game they, ever, he, he hasn't his changed his lines. For, kept his lines together for three straight periods. Unbelievable! He did. I was shocked. Um, okay, so my my non sarcastic asshole answer is. And I said this a little bit on the last pod, like it's kind of a cop out, but I just think that the chances that like everything's clicking perfectly and you know, you're not going to move anyone out of the lineup and everyone's healthy is just really slim. And even if that were the case, they would make a point to get Potra back in. It's, it's not good for anyone for him to like just sit on the bench and be a healthy scratch for, you know, a week straight. So they'll get him in and, I don't totally rule out them trying him on the wing. Um, Don Sweeney did leave that door open, which was a little bit of a shift because before the season, Jim Montgomery was asked if, you know, at that point when Podge was making a push to make the roster, he was asked if wing was an option. And he said, right now they really only viewed him as a center. He played wing, I think one game in the rookie tournament in Buffalo and, 
They didn't really love how it looked. Um, you know, Sweeney this week, you know, so two, two and a half months later, sounded a, a, at least a little more open to the idea. He said, like, Potch was a smart player. Usually smart players can figure it out, even if they're, you know, a little uncomfortable at first. Um, so I don't rule that out, and I don't think it would be a permanent move. It would just be like, here's another lineup option that we haven't looked at yet. Maybe we give it a look for a couple of games. But ultimately, you know, I think Morgan Geeky can play wing. Like, you know, I think he had some good games there early in the season, even on a line with Patra. So um, I kind of think things will sort themselves out. And Jim Montgomery will shake things up, as he always does. And ultimately, I still see Patra settling back in as the third line center. I feel like you're simultaneously in that take being pessimistic and optimistic. You're like, pessimistically, they're going to have issues and that lineup isn't going to stay exactly the same, which is optimistic that things are just going to work out how they have to work out. <laughs> you're, it's an interesting uh, yeah, arc there. Well, I mean, like I think back to, was it last year or the year before? I think it was last year where it was like they had eight or nine defensemen signed to NHL contracts and it was like, what on earth are they going to do when guys start to get healthy? And it's like, well, Mike Riley played himself out of a job. So, you know what I mean? Like very rarely are going to have like, you're, you're basically in the NHL, never going to have so many good players all healthy and playing well at the same time that it's like, Oh my God, we can't, there's just literally not enough minutes for everyone. Um, There's always going to be, something going on that opens the door for someone opens the door for somebody in the nhl our next question is um has to do with the the american hockey league uh the question is um parker watherspoon is still 26 and playing in the ahl is there an age limit to playing in the ahl at what point do most guys think it's time to move on well so watherspoon's obviously up with the Bruins now is, is playing. Um, to answer the, the last part, there, there is no age limit in the AHL. Uh, there are 30-something-year-olds in the AHL. I was watching the, the Providence game against the Toronto Marlies Wednesday night, and the Marlies have Kyle Clifford, who's 32 and you know has plenty of NHL experience, obviously just hasn't been able to you know catch on in an NHL job recently. Um, he did... Clifford scored a goal, just totally knocking Frederick Brunet um, like 10 feet off the puck on the four check, just as a quick aside. But um, so, yeah, so there's no there's no age limit. And it, it's interesting because this topic is Montgomery's kind of actually been asked about this a little bit uh, with Wotherspoon and how much AHL experience he has. And, um, you know, it's Kevin Paul Dupont who was asking and saying, like, you know, it's kind of rare nowadays to see someone who has five, six years in the AHL and still, you know, sticks it through and ends up making, you know, sticking in the NHL at that point. And, um, you know, it's a credit to, to Wotherspoon, but, you know, look, if you can play a long time in the AHL, yeah, everyone wants to get to the NHL and that's not ideal, but you can make enough money to make a good living. Like that's, that's not the worst career is to, to play in the AHL for six, seven, eight years into your late twenties or, or even your thirties. You know, the Bruins have Jason Magna down in the NHL. He's in his thirties down in the AHL rather. He's in his thirties. Yeah. And people will remember um, one of my favorite players of all time. He actually, I think he, I think he got pulled over um, for drunk driving and ended up coaching a peewee hockey team. But um he ended up playing for the Minnesota Wave, uh, and he was in his 30s, I think, too. Gordon Bombay. I don't know if you guys remember him. So, yeah, people can play. <laughs> I could see that coming. That coming. <laughs> in a very roundabout way, it was getting, it was going to get there. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to say, and this I say jokingly, because uh, Anton Strawman was sent down to Providence last last season, but I don't think he played a single game. So, I mean, he played like he played a couple, like literally just a couple, though. And he was like 36. Yeah. yeah. M- meanwhile, Yarmir Yager is the 51 and 
playing still in the Czech Republic. So yeah, he just he had an assist in the first game of the season. So. Yeah, I saw, he I saw he him. owns the team. He's just like he's just like yeah, I'm just gonna own this team and like play until I literally can't skate anymore. <laughs> that's that's. Talk about a guy who lives hockey, man. That's hilarious. I mean, he's probably still the best player on the team. If we're being real, like he's probably like, I. From the last time I saw him play, he was still pretty good. I mean, I know he's fifty-one, but uh, yeah. Okay, so let's move along down the list here. And again, there there is a lot to do with Matt Potter, so I'm gonna try to break it up a little bit, um, and then jump around, jump back to it. I was I was thinking maybe get to Mark. Allred's comment because his was has to do with Potter kind of the, the Merkelov thing, like to stick with the AHL. Okay. Talking yeah. about the AHL. So Mark said, if Georgie Merkelov is to get a call up soon, what is the ideal situation to put him in? I'd like to surround him with better talent. So like in the top six, but if fourth line duties are the plan for him in any recall, I'd rather keep him in Providence on the team's most productive offensive line. Um he also said thanks and happy holidays. So happy holidays to him too. Um, but I just want to start by saying I don't even think they're going to call up Georgie Merkelov. I feel like if they need another center, they're going to do what they did the other day, which is just move Frederick. Like I, I'm not sure that that's who's getting the call up. Like I wouldn't be surprised if it was Boquist comes up, Frederick plays center. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that that's – the way they decide to go rather than calling up Merkelov. We would all like to get a chance to see him play. So like if you asked us, would it make sense? And would we want to see it? We, we don't, pro I think we'll all say yes to that, but I just don't know if that's the actual move they would make. I tend to think it would be Frederick move him over. And just because we've seen them do that before and they trust Frederick I as a center in certain situations. So. I actually think it might be the move they make. Um, I think if in the specific scenario where one of Coil, Zaka, or Geeky has to miss a game or a couple games or whatever, I do think Merkulov might get called up because, Bridget, you're right. The last time they had to do that, they did just move Frederick over and Boquist went in. <clears throat> Boquist also played four minutes and didn't get a shift over the final, like, 35 minutes of the game. Um, so I don't know that they're going to look at that and be like, let's do that again. Uh, I could, I really could see them saying, Hey, first off, Georgie Merkelov's on fire. He has six goals in his last six games, uh, a point in nine of the last 11 games. He had a goal and an assist Wednesday night. Um, seems to be playing really well, just all around game. So I could definitely see them thinking like, Let's reward the guy who deserves it the most, who's playing the best. And we don't think it's going to be permanent, but, hey, there's two games here where we think we're going to be without one of the centers. Let's see what he does for two games. Like, I I definitely could see that because that's, like, to me, that's just kind of good organizational management to reward a guy who has earned a reward rather than just keep calling up the same guys who – in some cases aren't really taking advantage of their opportunities anyways. Well, I think they should do it. Like I said, I think that, like you said, you want to reward someone, you want to see what you have too. Um, I think that that's the move they should make. I'm just not sure if they're going to. Um, and also it's really hard to make a case for yourself when you only play four minutes. So it's not like, right. I wonder what they see in Boquist that they dislike to the point where they only play him four minutes. Like, I, I'm not sure exactly what their assessment of him is, but sometimes it feels like they call him up and then it's like an immediate slap in the face. Like they called him up and then he didn't play. And then they called him up and he played four minutes. Like, I don't really know what the situation is with him. Yeah. I mean, it, there's only so much we've seen of him. I think some of it might just be to kind of, you know, they, 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 he has NHL experience and I think they can just call him up and not worry too much about him and, um, I think they also don't really want egg on their face because they kind of gave him a shot in the offseason. I'm not really sure on Boquist, but as it pertains to Merkulov, um, you know, I agree with, with, with what you guys are saying. I think he should get a look. And I just want to give uh, Robert Chalmers a shout out because he also asked on Twitter, do you think it's only a matter of time before 
we see Mercury Loft get called up. So he also had a question regarding this. Um, look, I think for a lot of reasons he should. And first and foremost, he has – he's not – some random AHL player that just so happens to be producing, but there's not a lot of, uh, nobody really knows who he is. Like he's one, like he's definitely somebody in their system that everybody's been watching. And he's, he's somebody that, that we all hope is part of their future, the Bruins included. So he's holding up his end of the bargain. He is playing really well down in the minors. And I think there's a lesson to be had here for, as, as it pertains to managing people, like understanding how to manage people. And ironically, that's exactly what Don Sweeney is. He's a general manager, right? So it's like, you need to, you need to let your entire system of players understand. That, and that includes the AHL, the ECHL, whatever, that if you do what you're asked to do, and certainly if you do above what you're being asked to do, you should be rewarded. And, and, and maybe it's not a long-term call-up, but Merkulov needs to see this is why this is why I'm working so hard. This is why I'm producing because I am getting this opportunity here as opposed to going down there for a whole season, lighting it up and never getting called up. What does that do to somebody's morale? Like it's good for people to have an opportunity to chase, but once people start to feel like no matter what they do and they're not going to get that chance, it's disheartening and it kind of can send you down a, a – um, a spiral, I suppose. So if you want to optimize the player, you need to give them an opportunity when they've earned it, especially where the Bruins brass has talked about, like we, we give people opportunities if they earn it, like nobody's jobs are guaranteed. And, and this is an opportunity like Potters and world juniors, like the center is not the most stable position right now. So give the kid a chance, like let him, yeah, like, let him build some confidence and, and, and let him be assured that his hard effort and production has not been for naught. Yeah. And you know, that, that even if it is only a couple of games, like that message that the motivation that you can give him when he goes back down of, of like being able to say like, Hey, we really liked this, this, and this, and we want you to keep, we want you to work on this, this, and this, like now that's really going to sink in. Whereas you know, it seems by all accounts like Merkulov's taken him to coaching really well. But right now it's probably a lot of just, hey, keep doing these things you're doing and little tweaks here and there. Whereas you get that taste of the NHL, like now you've seen it. Now it's, you know, Jim Montgomery sitting down with you saying, here's what we want to see. Now it's, you know, Don Sweeney sitting down with you again. Like that message sinks in a lot more and you kind of go back with that extra motivation of like, okay, I saw it. I know like, this is what I have to do. This is what they're telling me. And like, there's his motivation for the next, however much longer he's down there. Um, I do, I do agree with Mark that if it's say it was like Johnny Beecher had to miss a game. I think it's probably not going to be Merkulov getting called up. Um, just because, you know, I don't really think he's like a, he's definitely improved his defense. I don't think it's, enough of a strength yet where you're throwing him to like a fourth line, kind of more of a grinder role. Um, you know, Pat, as much as people, some people on Twitter seem to hate him, but like Patrick Brown is with the team right now and they would probably just plug him in as fourth line center. Yeah. I was just about to bring that up. I was like, there's technically a center in the depth chart that's come up before Merkeloff already. And that's Patrick Brown. So, um, and like Scott mentioned, he's with the team. So, you know, it's the those are the the less sexy moves would be to plug in Patrick Brown again or move Frederick over. Um, but yeah, I think we all agree that we'd like to see more off. I just want to know, and the other part of the question, you guys already answered it, but I agree. Like, yeah, I, I would rather see Mercury off. Like, if you're gonna call him up, put him with players that have skill where he can um, you know, optimize his skill set. But I just don't know if you're not gonna reward the player not just to reward him, but because he's proving down in the minors, he might be able to help you if given the opportunity in the NHL. Why invest in players if when they do what you're hoping that they do doesn't amount to opportunity? Like, like that kind of annoys me. It's then, then why, then what is the Georgie Merkulov project? Why'd you sign him out of college? 
And 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 I'm not even saying like right now if he's not called up, but because of Popper and World Juniors, I'm just saying in general, it's like if he plays and plays well, but never gets an opportunity because you have the unreal center depth of Pavel Zaka, Charlie Coyle, Morgan Geeky, and like Patrick Brown and Johnny Beecher. It's like why is this kid not getting a chance again? So that'll that will annoy me if the year keeps progressing and no one's really grabbing the bull by the horns and he's still doing his thing down in the minors. I will probably get annoyed at that point. I'm not there yet, but I just want them to – I just want to know, like, if you're not going to plan on giving them a chance, then, then what's this all about? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a question of, like, okay, who who in the top line should either get knocked down to the fourth line or leave the lineup? Like, it, it's – you know, we've talked about it, but it's like the the Bruins have enough good forwards. Like, they have good depth up front. What they lack is, like – enough truly high end talent. And I don't think Margot is going to come up and be that. So it's like, okay, who's, who's out of the lineup, which is why I kind of only think this happens if there's an injury somewhere um, that opens a spot up because like, yeah, you could, you could call him up and say like, Hey, he's, he's earned it. You know, he's, this is a reward for his good play and we want to see what he can do. But then it's like, well, okay, but who are you knocking out of the lineup? Cause I'm not sure anyone currently playing in the top nine, like, I mean, maybe this can lead into a, you know, DeBrus question. Cause I'm sure that's where people's minds are going, but like, I don't know who you're taking out of the lineup or knocking down to the fourth line, because I do feel like most of those guys from, you know, are playing pretty well. They're just not elite scorers. Well, let me ask you this, Scott and Bridget, but uh, the knock on Merkulov, I think, since leaving uh, Ohio State was that he needed to work on uh, the defensive side of the puck, right? But his offensive skill set is there and it's very promising and whatnot. So if for some reason the Bruins feel like his defensive game isn't where it needs to be, isn't one way to mitigate that at the NHL level is to, like we've talked with like other players, like maybe try him on the wing. Like uh, because in that situation – you can you can ease into the NHL, and you're not you're not put in a position where you have all these defensive responsibilities. And maybe um, he's kind of free to 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 play um, play free offensively. But I also think there's a massive question out there of what is his what is his NHL ceiling? Is it a top six forward? I don't know if any of us know that. We can talk projections, but what do you think of that? Like. Say maybe what? Well, yeah, like I mean, you mentioned Jake DeBrus, but let's just say a, a winger isn't producing the way they need to produce, and maybe Merkulov gets a shot at gets a look at wing uh, for a couple of games. I don't, is that a possibility or not optimal? Well, and just like to refresh people's minds in case um, you know their background on Merkulov isn't. Um, you, you know, they don't know where exactly where he came from. Like you mentioned, he came out of Ohio State. He was not drafted. Uh, he was signed as a free agent, and Don Sweeney kind of got him to leave college a little bit early. Um, and so he now is playing in Providence, um, didn't finish his college at Ohio state. And the funny, it's funny that you mentioned that Brian, because if he gets a call up to wing before Fabian Lysel gets a call up to wing, like, I feel like that could cause another whole conversation similar to what we had yesterday about where Fabian Lysel is in, in terms of making the NHL and what his future looks like, because if it's not saying Georgie Merkulov shouldn't get a chance, but we we've had this exact same conversation about Fabian Lysel before. Um, if, a, you know, if a top six winger isn't producing, should they call him up? Well, I think it'd be pretty telling if Merkulov got that treatment and got brought up um, over Fabian Lysel, it would just kind of tell you where they, each of them are at in their process of getting closer to the NHL. Yeah, I think I think Merkulov played a little bit of wing early last season, so his first pro season. Um, but is definitely a natural center. I think I believe has only played center this season. So I would generally prefer when you call on someone up to play them at their natural position. But I guess it's not out of the question. Um by the way, since we mentioned Lysel, that game Wednesday night uh, against Toronto, Lysel tried to go one on four again, and I just like cringed watching it. I was like, 
didn't, didn't we just go through this on Sunday? Like, what, what are you doing, man? Um, and I thought he had been playing pretty well to that point, too, honestly. But then I saw that, and it's like, can't happen once a game. <laughs> like, that's not – it isn't working at the AHL. It's definitely not going to work in the NHL. No, and uh, it couldn't have been more clear that that was, like, the moment that he got called out for the previous game. Like, it was – very clear. It was word for word. Like he went again, one on four and we need him to get that out of his game. Yeah. Well, that's, that's something he's gonna have to work on. Cause now everybody's Mujanel kind of put him on notice and not just him, but all of the Bruins fan base now, that now everybody knows to look well, for it. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, the, their next game after the call outs on NHL network and the Bruins have an off night. So it's like, I'm sure there were a lot more eyeballs than, than usual for a, a Providence Bruins game. Yeah. And Mercury off plays well, which I think he said earlier. So just continues to score. But anyway, Scott, right, I'm... Providence, Providence ended up losing seven to three and just like straight up did not play defense at any point during that game. So that was, that was, that was not a great showing for them, but Mercury was good for sure. Mm. All right, so we did mention Jake DeBrusque. So let's go to a question from Liz, and she says, quite frankly, she says, what do you do with Jake DeBrusque? Do you think Monty should sit him at this point and try to kickstart him? The rookies are putting him to shame. Patra has more goals than him, and he's tied with Beecher. Yes, he's doing other things to contribute, but he needs to be their number three offensive guy. Goal scoring is why he is there, and his three-on-three play has been ugly. Do you agree that the longer this goes on, his trade value continues to go down? Um, I mean, yes, Liz, I think it, his, 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 his stock is low right now because his production's not there, but um, yeah. And I, his contract, like we've mm, mentioned this before, he's in a him. contract year. So right. the contract numbers for him go down as, as you know, the slump continues and if, or if there's not like a, a production boost. If, if he doesn't have the numbers to back up the kind of contract, I'm sure he went into the season thinking a different number than, than what they're looking at right now. Yeah. And, and people uh, have mentioned, and, and Liz mentioned it in a question that he's, he's, he's found other ways to contribute uh, uh, off the score sheet. I mean, I've, I've said it's on blue in the face. I don't, I don't, I don't see the contributions that everybody else or not everybody else that some seem to see with him, despite the scoring, I mean, I, oh, he's help. He's helping the team. The team has a record of, you know, seventeen five and one, and he's a part of that. Okay. Well, I also watched him be one of the reasons why they flat out lost in overtime. So uh, I'm getting, you know, you guys know how I feel about DeBrusque. I, I, I like the player's skill set and I like the player's personality off the ice, but I certainly don't love um, the the la the lax days of goal effort and and the and the mental. Um, he just seems mentally out of it sometimes and we never brought this up on the podcast but there was a game about a week or two ago uh and and the i think it was a national tv game and and then uh, i think it was against the devils and geeky and pop uh geeky and pasternak were on a line with debrusque and patra went out there with those two for a face-off and you see jim montgomery yelling at somebody on the bench um and and matt patra like i said went out with with, with geeky and and pasternak and the second the, the puck drops, he goes off the ice and DeBrusque pops on. So contextually, you could probably figure out that DeBrusque was just zoning out when his line was supposed to be out there. And Montgomery is like, what are you doing? Um, but anyway, that's I'm not going to go off on a tangent on DeBrusque. Um, I'll let you guys take this over and, and respond to Liz's question. What do you do with the kid? Is Can you even get anything for him right now? I mean, no question is value is not high right now. Like if you – if you trade him right now, you're you're selling low, and um, you know that someone else had I think asked a question along those lines too. Uh, it was Eric on Twitter. Um, we can get to that a little later because it's more about like a package, but um, yeah, I mean every other team sees the same thing every everyone else does. Like he's not scoring, and he's paid to be a scorer, so what you have to do is you keep playing him and keep working with him and you hope he pulls out of it. Like whether that's 
with the intention of keeping him through the season and him being a valuable player to you or improving his value for a potential trade. Like to me, that's the only option. I mean, yeah, if things get bad enough and you, you can healthy scratch them, like that's obviously an, an attention grabbing move. Um, you know, he was already scratched once this season for being late to a team meeting. So no doubt that would be an enormous story. And I think, I think if Jake DeBrus got healthy scratched, that would, you, you can certainly feel it like simmering again, where like, I don't know if he's going to get booed at the garden. Like he did after the trade request went public, but it feels like a healthy scratch would be like that green light to the fan base to like really turn on him again. Um, and at that point, you probably have to start seriously looking at trading him because I don't know how you get it back on the rails after that. I think what you have to do is you keep playing him and you hope he pulls out of it. I, I've said on here, like I'm one of the people who does think he's still doing other good things. Uh, I I do still think he's helping them win games. I know Ryan disagrees with that. I <laughs> I see him doing doing enough, you know, to again not to be worth four million dollars, but to help them win hockey games. Um, I don't think overall in the season, I don't think he's let like his defense slip or his penalty killing or his ability to set up teammates, which I think he's still been doing at a pretty high rate, he's not scoring. And I do think like you've started to see games and situations where that frustration is starting to show up. I think that shot in overtime was one of them. Like Jake DeBrus, when he's on his game, probably isn't taking that shot. I think, and Jim Montgomery talked about this a little on Thursday. Like I think he takes that shot because he's had a couple other chances in the game that he hasn't buried and he's frustrated. And he thinks, I don't know. He thinks he's going to go for a hero shot, but that obviously wasn't a smart play and ends up costing them the game. And it's like, that's what has to change. And the only way it changes is if he starts scoring. So I know we sound like a broken record, but like he, he needs to score and that's not going to happen. If you sit him or you start jerking around his minutes or whatever, like you've got to find a way to get him going because I, I don't think there's any other option besides that. Bridget, what did you think of the, uh, what did you think of his 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 back check, Bridget, and his and his and his wide his wide turn? Like Scott, that's like the frustration with the shot selection is one thing. You stop and you go the other way and you get your ass back. He just like everybody talks about that play. He's he there was enough time to get back. Like the goal scorer was also his guy. Like he he just he missed the net and literally went for a skate. And and I don't know how anybody can can say otherwise and that to me pissed me off far more than the shot missing the net because that does happen get the fuck back on defense (laughs) so so this was this also dates back to i forget what song you compared it to brian but i i agreed with scott for what it's worth I, me and xerxes agreed with scott on on this topic and um (laughs) that i said i would describe you know what's coming for him is like, I, I feel like the production is coming. Um, and I still think that, and I think that if you healthy scratch him, you, you, like Scott said, you open the door for people to turn even harder on him. And I just, I don't want to be in a place like we were when I, I personally think, and I know Brian, you disagree with me on this. Like sometimes booing your own players makes you look bad. Like I, I don't like that mm-hmm. look from any fan oh, base. Yeah. Um, I like that no, definitely and not. I don't think that I, I, I feel like it'd be a missed opportunity for the Bruins because we're already talking about how they might be down a top six winger. And like, if you take him out of the lineup or, you know, you, you trade him and don't get a, a, a top six uh, forward in return, then you're like, you may as well just stick with DeBrusque and hope he gets back to, form the way he did last year and how he did, how he responded to that last time he went through the adversity. Um, Cause it doesn't really do you that much to trade him away and lose someone in your top six. Um, you just have to hope that some of those other things that like, I know you brought up a bunch of the analytics last episode or two episodes ago, Scott, hope that the numbers are telling you that, 
you know, you're, you're about to get more out of him more, at least more like he was last season. So I think, I think you can't get rid of him without having another option to bring in to, to fit a top six role. Um, j- just to clarify my stance, cause I don't think I've actually said it yet as it pertains to scratching him. I would not scratch Jake DeBrusque because he doesn't, he, he has not shown he's been scratched before. Um, Scott, you mentioned earlier this year for missing a team breakfast, uh, shout out Tyler Sagan. Um, but Bruce Cassidy had scratched uh, Jake DeBrusque in the past uh, on multiple occasions. And he showed everybody that he'll come back the next game shot out of a cannon, but then he'll revert right back to, you know, kind of the same things that got him scratched in the first place. So, I don't think that Jake DeBrusque is the, is, is, has the mentality and he's not the type of player that responds well long-term to scratching. It kind of it becomes a slippery slope. Um, so I don't want to scratch him either. You know, he, he should play every game until you decide to move on from the player because he's not the type of player that will do well up in the press box at all for you. Um, Bridget, the song you were referring to that I said was Make It Happen um, by, by the record company. I have another song uh, lyric and it's called uh, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. And I think that um, people are starting to maybe realize that Jim Montgomery is getting a little annoyed at the brusque too. Um, And that (laughs) maybe Bruce Cassidy wasn't such a, a bad guy. Maybe like maybe DeBrusque is just the kind of player that coaches get frustrated with because there's so much potential there. And, it just doesn't seem to come to fruition enough. Brian, well, I have no let, idea let me, what I have no idea what artist it is that you're referring to on that last song. I think it's Travis Kelsey's girlfriend. I don't know. <laughs> um, let me. So I'm just looking at this. Jake DeBrus ice time the last four games: 1701, 1719, 1749, 1834. Why is Jim Montgomery still playing him that many minutes if you? think he's like that disappointed in his play because because as we were talking about like if you if you first of all there's always the potential that he will break out this team isn't necessarily necessarily littered with a bunch of Wayne Gretzky's out there like he is one of the players that is capable of scoring at a high level so that's why it's frustrating because you can't not play him especially when this team is a little bit lackluster offensively I also think Scott that there's a bit of catering to the players. He does not respond at all to getting demoted, getting benched. And I just, like, as I just said, I don't even think that's the right approach with him. Um, I also, I also have said before too, like, it's not that I don't think he, I, I'm not saying he's a, a liability out there. I, I know he's making like normal hockey plays that everybody else on the ice is also making. Like he's like, I'm not saying he's a bad player. I'm saying that, there's a lot more for him to give. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have all the answers, but, but he, he definitely is a, I mean, he's a, he's somebody that's capable of scoring 30 goals in this league. So that's why he keeps getting played. And I don't think he's a, I don't think he's the type of player to, to sit on the, on the bench and respond well. So Montgomery is kind of placating to, to the player, which I understand, but that's why. I, I actually just don't even think he's frustrated with him to start with. Like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know about I that. I mean, he made the comment about that one shot, like the overtime shot. But like in general, I I don't get the sense that like Montgomery's not. I mean, he's not the same kind of coach as Cassidy, where he calls guys out the same way. But just don't get the sense that he's like over Jake DeBrusque at this point. Do you do you guys see I, him? I think. Go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, I was gonna say, I, I Montgomery has made a couple comments at times about his details have slipped a little or, and he always kind of either prefaces it or follows it up with that's what happens when a player is used to scoring isn't scoring. And I, I think that's legitimately what Jim Montgomery believes. Like, I don't think he's, I don't think he's lying. He, he might hide a little bit of frustration here and there, but I think he truly believes that Jake DeBrusque is a good player who's mostly doing good things, but who is getting more and more frustrated that he's not scoring. And I asked Montgomery today, like, is there anything you can do to counter that frustration? Or is the only solution that it just has to start going in at some point? And Montgomery 
said like straight up, like it has to start going in. Like there's no other shortcut to a guy who's used to scoring to stop being frustrated other than to start scoring like he's used to. Do you, do you know why, do you know why it's not going in for him? It's because he's not doing what it takes enough consistently enough for it to go in for him. I guarantee you guys, if Jake DeBrusque for five games, five games straight, call it, you know what? Scratch that. Call it three games tops. If for three games in a row, every time you watch Jake DeBrusque, he was busting his ass and going hard to the blue paint and working hard in the corners. I guarantee you guys, okay, I, I trust me, I don't pretend to be all knowing or the smartest person in the world, but I've watched enough hockey in my life to know and play enough hockey to know you will get rewarded if you do what's what's necessary consistently enough, shift in and shift out. I guarantee you guys, if for two or three games in a row, he busted his ass straight line, played inside hockey, went to the net, got body position in front, he would at the very least get a puck and went off his skate. I, I guarantee you guys. And it's not happening because he's playing on the perimeter far too much. And that doesn't mean that he's not making high quality plays, you know, um, in the D zone or, you know, making the right plays to help his team analytically. All I'm telling you guys is that if he really wanted to bust out of this slump and you see it all the time with great players, if they have to bust out of a slump and they hit that point where like enough is enough, you'll start to see the most skilled players in the world play like fourth liners because that's what it takes to bust out of a slump. I'm telling you guys, he needs to do that. And then if he gets that confidence going, maybe he'll take off. But until then, that's just my opinion on him. And we can agree to disagree, but I, and especially him as a player, he does all of his scoring in tight. It's no secret. Like he's just not doing it enough. Maybe a shift here and there, but not enough. That's my opinion, but we can move on if you guys want to. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that last part. Like that is, that's the finishing product that's missing that he needs to find. And he needs to find it by being in those areas where your percentage of scoring goes up. Like it, his shooting percentage being so low is partly bad luck, which I absolutely think is part of this, but it's also partly that it's that he's taking a higher, more of his shots are coming from lower percentage areas than when he's scoring 30 goals. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we do not have a lot of time left, so I don't know what you guys want to do here. Um, we have, yeah, Trent's comment. We have Don's weenie on Twitter again, um, which we have, you know, we, we have our suspicions that that's Scott's burner account. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like some of these two, we, we might just want to save because, they're not like time sensitive. The Don's weenie oh, ones, at least. Yeah, Don Don's weenie threw some uh, kind of just like fun facts and random stats at us. Yeah, that can probably be saved. Um, I, I like this. I like this one from Mark uh, by email, not Mark Allred, different Mark. Um, we've touched on this a little, but I think it's maybe worth getting to. Question about Bedard versus Padra. Not comparing talent at all, but I am curious about ice time. Bedard is 18 and Padra is 19. Did Bedard play more than 68 games last year? Why are the Blackhawks not concerned about load management for Bedard? Like the Bruins are for Padra and the, he said Sharks, but obviously meant Ducks, are for Leo, Leo Carlson. Um, we get the Blackhawks are at the bottom of the barrel, but so are the Ducks. Why is there no concern about Bedard hitting a rookie wall like there are for Potter and other players. Also seems to be no concern for Fantilli with Columbus. Um, and then he goes on to a separate issue. But let's start there. Uh, do you guys have a take on why load management seems to matter more for Patra and they're not just riding him like Chicago is with Bedard? Well, I think there's a big PR Um uh strategy at play here for chicago i think when you have a generational talent it's tough to sell to the fans that are trying to buy season tickets that we're going to have them on a on a um on a, on a leash and a and a load management plan i think matt patra is a he's not as much of a star name and certainly 
there's a lot going on here in Boston. People aren't going to really care too much. I mean, Bruins fans talk about it, but I think there's a PR spin there for Chicago. Um, that's at play. I also think that it's a new concept, right? So it's kind of like the teams that are doing it are, are more the, the anomaly to this point. Um, those are the first two things that come to mind for me. Yeah, I would also say that the Blackhawks don't have to worry about Connor Bedard holding up into May or June. The Blackhawks know that they are not making the playoffs. They are well out of it. it was yeah, never they're second to last in the conference. <laughs> yeah, it was never a realistic goal for them. So they can play Connor Bedard as much as their heart desires. And if he wears down in March, they can ride it out to the finish line, get to the offseason and say, all right, Connor, here's where you wore down this season. How do we get you ready for 20 plus more games next year? And have you last into April? And we hope we're building a playoff team. So at some point beyond that, the Bruins are planning to play hockey into late April, hopefully May, hopefully June. So they need to, they do need to worry about not just how do we get Matt Potter to the end of the regular season, but how do we have him relatively fresh and continuing to play well beyond that? And so that's, it's a totally different situation. And the Bruins have to have that bigger picture in mind because their goals for this season are different than Chicago. Yeah, and, and Connor Bedard's a generational talent that is just different than anyone. Like, it's hard to compare him to anyone. Um, that's, you know, another rookie in the league right now. Um, he's just kind of his own <laughs> his own thing. And I was looking up, like, the comparison of Patra and Bedard in terms of, like, weight and size. And they're almost exactly the same height and weight. I think pa Patra's listed as a, an inch taller, five pounds lighter. Um, so they, they're comparable in that way that, you know, they probably could both put on a little bit of weight. Um, but yeah, I just, I think also the main point, uh, being that ticket sales, I mean, that's who people want to come see, right? Like people, people are buying tickets to away games just to come see Connor Bedard. Like people in Boston opening night were there for the Bruins, but they're also hoping to see Bedard, you know, in his first ever NHL game. And he's a draw for fans, which is, um, a, you know, an increase in money in your pocket if you're the Chicago Blackhawks. And at that, at this point, um, you're kind of just trying to stoke excitement about what he could be to sell more tickets, to get the fan base kind of heading back in the right direction. Cause that was a great fan base back when, Kane and Taze were in their prime and they were making deep Stanley cup playoff runs. And it's like, just try to revitalize, like re-energize that fan base by, you know, we're not competitive this year, but we do have this other thing you can come watch that maybe one day is going to be our, our, you know, our next captain or our next reason why we win a Stanley cup. Okay. So real quick, let's just hit two more. We, we already touched a lot on DeBrusque. I don't, I, I do want to. Sorry, Brent. One last thing. I wanted to note that uh, on the latest, I think it was T TSN's um, insider segment that they do like every week, uh, they were reported that the Ducks might actually be ending the, the quote unquote Leo plan um, in like another month or so. So like starting towards the end of January, Carlson might actually, play every game, um, which I would say like that doesn't mean that the Bruins are also going to end the Potra plan because, again, Anaheim has fallen. After a hot start, Anaheim has really dropped off. They're probably not making the playoffs. So, again, like they can they can start playing Leo Carlson every game, and if he wears down at some point, it doesn't really matter to them. And, by the way, there was no Potra plan to start the season. Don Sweeney was talking about that in his press conference, too, this week. It was – they kind of adapted it on the fly and they'll, I mean, they'll change it again. There's not like a set plan in place. They're just kind of reading off of where he looks like he's at. And it wasn't from the beginning that they were like, no, he's young. We're going to give him these rest days. So it could change. That could change for Potter as well. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a copycat league. It's, it's the classic, you know, um, 
Katie Heron wore army pants and flip flops. So I wore army pants and flip flops. That's what happens around the league with these coaches. Um, let's just lump in these last two questions together because Eric and, and Trent both had some questions regarding, you know, uh, future trade potential, uh, opportunities. And I'd be remiss if we didn't give them a shout out because they did take the time to submit a question. So just real quick, um, Eric talks about if the Bruins package, uh, DeBrusque and Grizzly right now, acknowledging that they'd be selling low. Are there any top six forwards or second pairing defensemen they could get in return? Um, put a pin in that. And then Trent talked about uh, the goaltenders can't play two goalies at the same time and won't win in the playoffs. I think this is the time to explore all mark. If you can get a first or second round and a top six forward, you know, you should do that, blah, blah, blah. And cites the the major haul that the Tampa Bay Lightning got back for Tanner Janot last year, basically saying like, Less far lesser players have gotten big packages in return. So, um, Grizzlick, DeBrusque, Allmark, what's the market out there for these guys? Do the Bruins should the Bruins be entertaining? I know we've talked about this before, but you know, it is mailbag. So, yeah. So, I'll start start with the idea of like a DeBrusque Grizzlick package. Those are going to be two separate trades. Like, if you're if your goal is to get a top six forward or a second pairing defenseman. You're not getting that for those two guys because they're those are two different types of teams you're dealing with. The the team that might be interested in DeBrusque and or Grizzly is a team that's going for it this year. Um, because those guys are two pending free agents. So you can't trade them to a rebuilding team. No rebuilding team is gonna have interest. So you have to trade them to a contender, hope you get something, and then turn around and go spend that buying from a selling team, a rebuilding team. It's a lot to line up, and I don't know exactly what DeBrusque and Grizzly are getting you right now. We've talked about DeBrusque's value being down. I also don't think Matt Grizzly is playing as well as he usually does in the regular season. So um, generally it's not great business to trade two depressed assets. Is also the whole – Salary aspect of it, like, yes, train those guys with clear cap space, but where are they going? Because very few contending teams have cap space to be able to take them on. So, like, are you retaining some? Like, what? It's just, it's tough for me to imagine this kind of trade happening because realistically, the answer is like, you probably just have to stick it out with those guys and hope that they start playing better. And maybe, you know, maybe if you have something bigger in mind, you, you flip one of them as, as a lead up to it. But you have to, you basically almost have to have that second deal ready to go because Don Sweeney looks really bad if he trades away Jake DeBrus just because, hey, DeBrus is struggling and we're going to go try to get another top six forward somewhere. He trades him away, DeBrus gets hot. And then all of a sudden, there's not really a great market to go buy a second line forward. And it's, Either they don't add one or they settle for something lesser or they have to way overpay to get it. And now you're sitting and then that guy comes in and maybe like he doesn't even light the world on fire. And now you're going, wait, so we just dumped Jake DeBrusque and we gave up a first and a second round pick. And we're getting a guy who's producing the same amount as Jake DeBrusque. Why did we just do all that? Which is why I think it's hard to see this happening. Yeah. Yeah, and also it's hard to see it happening. Like if we're talking about this as a trade deadline move um, and the Bruins are a contending team, they tend to want to add defensive depth at that time of the year, not trade away um, somebody who is currently playing on their top D, their top D pair with, with McAvoy um, when he's healthy. So um, it just doesn't seem likely to me that, that Grizzly would be getting traded at that point in the season. And – once again, like what the return would be, you know, in that case, if they, if they even were considering it, but that's the time of year where you're, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, do we have enough defensive depth and usually adding there, not, not sending someone away. Now, now as it pertains to uh, Lena Solmark, we've talked about this before as well. I think we'll just finish off uh, here, but basically the sentiment that you could get a, a major haul for Omar because other teams get major hauls for much less. Um, where do you guys feel his value is at? And again, it, it, it's twofold, right? It's 
what's his value, but but what what's what's the what's the need across the league for um you know a number one goaltender um like in the middle of a season um so especially to a contender now i i personally think like you know there could be a team out there that that wants to trade for Omar that might not be in a playoff position this year but they see themselves being on the cusp next year and they're just a goalie away so it's not so much what's the players what's the player there's what's the there's what the player's worth and then there's what's the demand around the league for that position and and then it kind of comes somewhere in between right right and it's also like where are the bruins willing to send him because i'm sure the carolina hurricanes would love to try to trade for a goalie like linus allmark right now but if you're the bruins are you gonna send him to a team you might Face as early as the first round of the playoffs. The way that Hurricanes are going, like they're battling for a wild card spot. So, do you really want to put yourself in that position? Like, God forbid you trade Linus Elmark away and he shuts the door on you in the first round and ends your season. Like, boy, does that look pretty stupid if that happens. So, most likely you want to send him out west. And again, like it, it has to line up, it has to make sense. I think. You know, Trent mentions like a first or second round pick and a top six forward. I think if something like that was on the table, they might have already traded them. I don't think they've gotten an offer like that. Well, and and if you're if you're picturing a Venn diagram, right? You have well, you can't see my hands, but in in one circle you have the teams that, to your point, Scott, like the Bruins would be willing to send him to. Then in the other circle you have the sixteen teams on All Mark's no trade list then where the overlap is might only be a handful of teams in general right so it's it's yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of play and then you add yeah then you add another layer of like who's buyers like and who's sellers like you take out the the buyers from like i mean you take out the sellers from from that like you have to take out certain teams who just don't need a goalie or you know what i mean like there there's certain there's a lot of reasons why certain teams don't want him or couldn't get him including the no trade clause so it it just seems like and i think i forget what episode this was i would love to refer um him back to this episode because we went really in depth on it It, it's titled uh, in one of the segments that i clipped off um you know revisiting the the all mark trade idea um that we kind of got more in depth about his his situation and why we like we couldn't really come up with a team that made a whole lot of sense um that it would work for everyone for for listeners uh, it's if you want to go back and bookmark it it was somewhere somewhere between episode 42 and then 256 <laughs> <laughs> you should it, be able to find it in there it, it was actually pretty recent you, like you should it was it there. was and it's literally titled like revisiting the Olmark trade idea or something and it started off of you know some comments that were made on our show by mike milbury who brought it back up but Right. And yeah. and like as for like the, the Tan and Geno aspect, Tampa paid that much for Tan and Geno because they were up against the cap and Tan and Geno at the time was only making eight hundred thousand dollars and had scored I think twenty five goals the year before. Um and then they signed him to a somewhat cheap extension, although I don't know if he's totally lived up to even what he got, but anyways, that was part part of that trade was because it was one of the only moves Tampa could make where they could add and still fit it under the cap because he was making so little money. So that was part of the reason why Tampa gave up so much in that trade. Um, Tampa in general is also a bit of a unicorn because they have over and over again, shown a willingness to quote unquote overpay in trades. Um, There just aren't a lot of teams that are willing to part with assets like they are. And, you know, we keep, waiting for it to catch up to them. And this might finally be the year. Like they're out of the playoffs right now. They've really struggled. Their depth is really sapped this season. Um, So, you know, there is, there is just in general, most teams are not willing to totally trade away the future, the way that the lightning have over the last five years. And, um, and then we have one final question. This one just came in. It's from Brian in the car, and it says, Bridget and Scott, do you prefer 
hot apple cider or eggnog on Christmas? What do you guys think about that question? I'm, I'm really... an egg. I'm an eggnog guy. I oh, love eggnog. I don't drink eggnog. I don't drink. Someone gave me eggnog moonshine though, um, which is interesting. But don't know, if Scott. Maybe Scott wants some. But <laughs> sure. And pass, I pass it over. Well, what I usually do on Christmas is we've done mulled wine in the past. We've done sangria. Um, so, yeah, really neither of those things that Brian listed are, are like Christmas tradition over here. We usually start with champagne or mimosas and then go to like some sangria later. Hmm. OK, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I mean, I think I think eggnog's a pretty polarizing drink. People either love it or they hate it. I mean, I I guess I kind of fall in the middle. I I like eggnog, but I don't I don't have it very often. I probably have like half a glass every like two or three years. But it's you very, want the you want the moonshine that I got the eggnog moonshine. Sure, send it over. What they call it? Spiked eggnog, right? It's like it's, it's from like um, Old Smoky Whiskey. Mm -hmm. I was given it as a gift, um, which is like a moonshine distillery like slash whiskey distillery <laughs> in, in uh, Tennessee. So. Yeah. But I, I was like whiskey eggnog I can do. I don't know. Moonshine in general, you know, had it a few times. I don't think it's a little, little too strong for me. It's, I think it's whiskey eggnog. Okay. I don't know. That's, that's I did have a shot of it at my Christmas party, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I like it or not. It's better than the pickle whiskey that we had as a punishment for, um, you know, so yeah. that was terrible. Would not recommend. Do not drink pickle you know whiskey. You know, what's crazy. And this, this just came to me and it's just, I don't know, just that time of year, but I'm just thinking back to last year and it's, it's, isn't it crazy how fast time flies this, this time last year, you guys were, um, you guys were gearing up for your little, um, uh, media skate at Fenway for the winter yeah. classic. I was heading to Florida and here we are. This was actually, this is pre, pre, uh, stream yard, pre YouTube, just, just before we started that actually. Yes. Yeah, we didn't start, thank God. We didn't start posting the videos of these until like March, which was a good, yeah. a good thing. A good thing for me because I had a rough January. So I didn't look so great. I was recording in like my robe and like crying. I don't know. You you guys, you lucky viewers didn't get a chance to see that. But yeah, that now now I look fine. I, I don't wear the robe. But, but by the way, before we sign off and we all go get dinner, um scott do you want to see what part of your christmas gift is unfortunately we're out of time we'll <laughs> talk to you guys after christmas so so i got plenty if anyone that's any one of our viewers or listeners would like some you just let me know because i got this in the mail yesterday and it is 25 stickers of scott's pops <laughs> that you it. can put on they're pretty big they're they're high quality my mom already has one that she took and has it on her water bottle so <laughs> these are for the, Brian, your mom took or one. that you put on your mom's water bottle and no she's walking i around swear like, to god my mom goes can i have one this? i swear to god my mom goes Whoa. can i have one and then she i'll send you a picture of it and then she goes and she puts, she's trying to find a spot that's like has enough room open and she, she sticks it on there. And where is it? It's front and center, right over where she drinks out of. And she was like, I didn't mean to put them right there, but that was the only place there was room. So I'm not kidding you. Like literally there is a Scott's Pops face sticker on my mom's water bottle now. I got to find where else to put some of these because I got some to spare. How if many anyone wants them. Uh, how, many, how, how many did you make up? 25, but I, you 25. know, there's always time. There's always time for more. Can you, can you, how, how quick would it be to get another roughly 17,000? Because I think it will be really <laughs> great to do what the lower lock monsters used to do at the Songus, which is they'd have that, that hood thing, bl like blip. <laughs> what was it called? A blimp? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fly, flying around the Songus and they would just like drop like coupons and just, <laughs> if we just get one of those in the garden, just drop seventeen thousand Scotts pops, and um, well, we don't even need that because I'm already on the ninth floor, so I can make it rain from up there. I, That's we don't true. need. <laughs> imagine, imagine somebody just watching the Bruins game, and they have like they have one of those uh, those draft beers, and all of a sudden they just see a little Scotts pop just float into their into their drink. They'd be like, "What the fuck is this thing?" 
<laughs> like, <laughs> what is this? And where did it come from? And why do I love it? And by the way, that's not it. That's not all. The uh, Scott's Pop <laughs> Pens. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you vista print uh, for helping me <laughs> wow. and uh there is more on its way so we're not we're not 100 percent done but that's what i got in yesterday so yeah, i think you know something uh, Br- scott I, you should thank bridget not just for the gift but i think she's on to something like you should have a like you should have a, a an article, like a weekly article on on wei.com just called Scott's Pops, and it's just like you know, it could be anything. What's on your mind in pop culture? Just, stop doing. <laughs> doing or Scott, Scott pops. pops Scott pops off about <laughs> whatever whatever he's mad about that week. I can see I can see it now. I can see every mall in America. I can see onions, pretzels, and Scott's Pops popcorn. You would be an absolute billionaire, Scott. You, you wouldn't even be on this podcast. That's for damn sure. Mm-hmm. I'd at least make like 20 cents or so. I mean, <laughs> might, might come up a little short of a billion. But, uh, <laughs> he's, he's just speechless. He's just. We're, we're really just, we're finding a way to monetize Scott's love of popcorn is what, yeah. like, we're trying to help him make a career out of it. I know. It's not even about Scott at this point. I feel like this is our, our well, your business endeavor. And I'm, well, you know, you're going to have to pay me for the rights to use the images well, that I have yeah. made. So yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that's true. Im- image rights. Serious I already history. trademarked it. Don't even. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm on board. All right, guys. Hour 26 in. Long episode. Merry Christmas. You're welcome for the extended edition of the Skate Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, it's our gift to you. Enter and- to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most people are like, uh, yeah, a gift would be a 30 minute episode, not a hundred uh, or an hour 30, <laughs> but whatever. Um, any final comments? Well, guys? Listen, ju- you know, just like people split up some long movies, like, like, you know, people watch Oppenheimer, like as like four episodes or whatever, mm-hmm. people can li- split this up, listen to it in a, you know, as uh, episodes, because we are taking a little bit of time and our next episode will not be until after Christmas. So plenty of time for people to listen to an hour and a half. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All righty. Well, uh, on behalf of myself, Bridget and Scott, and the entire podcast, um, you know, the, the camera crew, uh, the lights crew, the writers, Xerxes, Xerxes um, Melvin, who just barked, but I don't think Melvin, you could hear it. I, our, I did hear that a little. <laughs> yep. <laughs> our investors, um, Scott, I mean, Scott's Pops Incorporated, Scott's Pops Incorporated, um, you know, yeah, like everybody behind the scenes. Vista like print. Such an, it's such an Vista print. It's such an exhaustive team. You know, Every, everyone behind the scenes, which is actually just Bridget. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> me on Photoshop. <laughs> uh, we would obviously like to, you know, wish everybody listening a, a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday season. Uh, we'll be back before New Year's or, or after New Year's. Yeah, or, yeah, okay. So yeah, we'll definitely do at least one too long. New Year's. Won't be too long, but. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for sending in questions and for, you know, listening all year. Um, you know, we really appreciate it. And we love, we love interacting with you guys and, and answering your questions and, and shooting the breeze. So let's keep it going into 2024. Thank you all for listening. And we'll talk to you very soon. Hey guys, thanks for watching this gate podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.